Hi, welcome back to the final day of the London Conference 2020. I'm Kate Spilio Bliss, Head of Events at Centre for London. As a reminder, if you'd like to tweet about anything you've seen this week or this session, use the hashtag LUNCONF20. That's L-O-N-C-O-N-F 20. And if you're in the Zoom webinar with us this morning, you can use the Q&A box to ask questions of any of our panelists. Uh, that's at the menu at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side. And do make liberal use of the chat function as well. It's there for you to use. Uh, so Center for London put out a report called Culture Club on social mobility in the creative and cultural sector in 2019. And ever since then, we've been keeping a close eye on what's happening in London's cultural sector. Uh, obviously, during the past eight months, cultural sector has received quite a bit of a hit. But uh, before that, it was one of the fastest growing sectors in London. And the jobs there are much less vulnerable to, vulnerable to automation than quite a few other sectors. So uh, in addition to that being important, it's also one of the best things about living in London and a big contributor to our economy and our quality of life. So once London's back on its feet, we're going to be looking at what we can do to foster a rebirth of the cultural sector in London and make sure that it's flourishing across the city. Uh, now I'm going to be handing over to the Director of Centre for London, Ben Rogers, who's chairing this session. Ben, welcome to the stage. Ben, I think you're still muted. Sorry. Right. Thank you, Kate. Um, Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, and, and welcome from me as well to this uh, session of London Conference 2020 on um, culture and how we can create a cultural renaissance in London. Uh, I am delighted to be joined by three great panelists, uh, Jessica Menzer, who is uh, part of the Brent uh, Blueprint Collective um, and a young uh, cultural um, freelancer, uh, she uh, has just got a degree um, in, in theatre. I thought I'd misread it because it said 2000, she'd graduated in 2019 and I assumed it was a typo, but it wasn't. But she's, she's done an extraordinary amount already as a, as a director um, and as a performer. Um, and we're really pleased to have her with us today. Uh, Ed, Ed Vasey, who of course, and around to most of us, I'm sure, was um, I think the longest serving cultural minister uh, ever um, under uh, David Cameron and a great defender of the Arts and Gus Casey Hayford, who is the director of the VNA East, um, London's sort of one of London's most exciting new cultural ventures, creating an, um, uh, a new VNA um, in the Olympic Park. And previously, uh, Gus was um, director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art um, in Washington. And you will have seen him um, on TV and perhaps read his books, including um, the BBC series on the Lost Kingdoms of Africa. And his TED talk on Islamic culture has been viewed more than a million times. No, is that, can that be right? That's amazing. So um, a really, really great audience. I mean, I think Kate has already made the point that, you know, this is not just a sort of peripheral uh, industry uh, for London. Um, I get a bit dispirited when I hear um, sometimes, you know, people from business groups or um, uh, the City of London and elsewhere, or not City of London, but from business groups talking about sort of why London is such a great city and, and what makes it so competitive. And they talk about the airports and the rule of law and the time zone and the language. And I always want to scream, no, no, it's not, it's culture. Um, you know, this, what, that's the one thing that we really, I think, beat the world on. Um, it's it's no, no other city I think quite has the sort of offer the vibrancy just the diversity of sort of cultural scene that London has um, but uh, we know that it's taken a heavy hit um, you can't produce culture uh, without face-to-face -face contact it seems to me um, you certainly can't do the performing arts and and, and, and you know, film and many others um, and while you can consume some culture you know in your bedroom um, uh, you certainly can't consume um, the performing arts in the same way or visit a museum. So, you know, we know that it's been a major blow to London's cultural industries. Uh, we did it to recover and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask first Gus and then Jessica to just tell us a bit about their relationship with London um, and how the pandemic has affected their, their work. Uh, Gus, let's start with you. Gus, you're on mute. Apologies, rookie mistake. I began this year actually in Washington DC where I was um, finishing off my 
role as the um, director of the National Museum of African Art. And I only got back on the very last flight out of Washington DC as lockdown began to kick in here in London and um, came back into a new role of trying to build this new museum. And it was a shock to the system both to be back in London because by comparison with DC, which is a fantastic city, London is just, and in terms of its arts offer, we are so, so blessed. Um, but to see it through, through the lens of lockdown and COVID um, was fascinating. I, I live quite close to Hampstead Heath and the, the way in which people would use that as a venue during lockdown for impromptu concerts and, and poetry readings. And you just have this sense of the expectation and the, 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 the kind of sense of, 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 um, of ambient um, um, love of the arts, which is so great. And I feel it to be a real privilege to work here and to be responding to that. And at the VNA to be building a new museum um, of course, in the face of recession and post-COVID and with all the complexities of Brexit. But in this city, I see it as being a fantastic opportunity to engage with um, a really unique demography and a fantastic history and a sense of cultural expectation, which is unlike any other. And what, what is your relationship to London? Have you, have you you've lived here before? You grew up here? I was born here and I've, I, I've lived here much of my life um, and I adore it. And, you know, the, the, the reasons I adore it are in great part because of culture. Um, you know, that's the thing that has, 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 has often rescued me, that I, you know, grew up and kind of, um, um, you know, in South London. And, you know, museums were the place that I would, would hang out. And, you know, I was probably quite a geeky kid, but having free access to museums was was my savior so i i adore this city and um i will do anything i can to fight for its its future particularly in relation to the arts which i know through this period has been deeply impacted both in terms of its funding and its audiences and we need to do whatever we can to rescue it because it is so critical actually the lifeblood of this city so Fantastic to be back, and I'll do whatever I can to uh, make sure that the arts um, um, continue to thrive. Great. Well, it's great to have you back. We had Andy Byford, who's just come from New York, so you're you're our second uh, to run transport <laughs> for London. So you're, our, you're I guess you're the Andy Byford of, of, of the arts. Um, uh, uh, Jessica, tell us a bit about your relationship to London and how um, the pandemic has impacted your your work and and indeed and indeed um, uh, the Brent Borough of Culture. Okay. So I was born in London, North West London, and I think I've lived in London all my life and I've loved it so much. And I think it's not till I went to university that I realised how much I would miss it, because I guess the culture at my university was not as, there wasn't much of a diverse culture, which is what I realised once I got there. And so when I came back to London and did my placement year, I was then infused a bit more into the theatre scene and went to more um, arts events and travelled a lot, I think a lot through my um, placement year to different parts of London, whether that be South, East and North, just getting to understand the different cultures and people around there and making friends in those areas. So I think London has played a massive part as to who I am. And coming from Brent, especially during with the London Borough of Culture, I think it was a great initiative to be part of as well, since the whole purpose of the um, London Borough of Culture and it being to Brent is to invest into the arts and the artistic community, but also seeing how they can push arts and culture within their educational programs and for the local people. And I think, and I, the reason I was like, I definitely want to be part of that because, okay, I'm part, I'm part of an industry that is about arts and culture. And because it was about putting young people at the heart of their program, I thought, yeah, this is important because I want to be part of making sure that young people like me can access the arts and we can push it and we can celebrate what Brent is about because there's so much to offer. And I think growing up in this area, I wasn't exposed to so much arts and culture till I did my placement year, which was like my third year at university. So I felt it really did impact me. And with the pandemic, oh, sorry, go on, were you going to... Uh, so you, you, when you went to university, you weren't doing an arts degree. You weren't doing arts as your main degree. Oh, no, I, so I studied theatre and performance, but I think it wasn't until I'd come back to my when I'd taken my placement and returned to London, right. I then learned more about the theatre scene. So I went to like the National Theatre for the first time, and it's like I've lived in London in my life, but it wasn't until I did my placement year that I started to access have access to all these different theatre places that I never know, had known about, but they've always been there. 
So yeah, that's what I meant by that. Great. Yeah. Uh, and Ed, uh, over to you. So as I said, you were Arts Minister from 2010 to 2016, which in ministerial terms is a, lifeline, a lifetime. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're, we're seen as a sort of great champion of, of the arts. I mean, looking back, what are you proudest of that, that you achieved as Minister um, uh, for Culture? And what are you frustrated about? But tell us first about your relationship to London. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was born and grew up in London, and despite uh, representing a seat in Oxfordshire, I, I would broadly call myself a Londoner, and I grew up around London culture because my mother and indeed probably my father as well were both uh, deeply involved in the arts. So I was um, kind of uh, immersed in the arts from a very young age in London. Um, I think, uh, you know, I was very proud to have served for so long as culture minister, and uh, I'm proud of what I achieved I published the first white paper uh, on culture for 50 years, which, you know, is just a document that sit, perhaps sits on a shelf, but it did at least kind of bring together arts policy in a coherent way. I think, uh, you know, we had a limited budget. We were living with austerity, but I think we managed to duck and weave, if you like, in terms of uh, the programs we had to end, but keeping money flowing into arts organizations, which was my top priority. And I think uh, there were certain other achievements like uh, coordinating music education, which was uh, something which was threatened, I think, by the education reforms of Michael Gove, but we managed to work with him to secure it. So there were a lot of things I'm very proud of. Weirdly, there are some obscure things like the decision to sell Blythe House in Hammersmith, which is a museum storage site, which indirectly, I think, led to the creation of v East. Um, so it's good. The big thing that I got wrong, I think, is access, genuine access to the arts, making a real step change difference to how people from all different walks of life can access the arts. Just say a bit more about that, Ed. Ed just say a bit more about that, because that's, that, that's interesting. I mean, you're, you're, you're thinking about both sort of practitioners and audiences. Well, we talked a lot about, well, I started a conversation about diversity and I make no apologies. Sometimes this anecdote goes down very badly with people. Sometimes people understand it. You know, I live in a bubble. Uh, you can look at me and you know exactly what my background is. And it wasn't until I went to see Lenny Henry playing in the Comedy of Errors that I suddenly realized the power of seeing someone who looks like you on stage because the audience was very, very different. The fact that I noticed that, I think, uh, defined what the problem was and we began a very big conversation about diversity in television and theatre and film which is still carrying on and which I think has made progress not nearly enough progress as should have been made but I think the bit that I missed uh, was about you know I, I find it very frustrating that um, a museum can publish an annual report and it will say you know 50,000 school kids visited our museum and to me that is completely meaningless um, what kind of experience did they have? What kind of ongoing engagement will they have with that organization? We put forward ideas like kind of, um, you know, this sounds slightly facetious or banal, but kind of work experience, uh, twinning with galleries where kids could potentially you know, even work in the box office or whatever, but they would have a kind of strong relationship with that institution. And I think as well that uh, we, we didn't really think through uh, what you could do to ensure that kids really engage. And I also think, and it's my critique of the arts establishment, if you like, that um, there are too many boxes being ticked, but not enough really hard thinking about what can actually turn people on to the arts. And also how you engage with new generations. You know, Gus was talking about hanging out in museums as a kid and being a geek. You know, to be crude about it, we know where our kids hang out today and they hang out on their screens. What, what are we doing about really engaging kids so that eventually they do go and hang out at, at the museum, if that is indeed the goal, uh, so that they really do have an engagement with the arts. And it's a very complex and very nuanced debate. But I hold my hands up to say, I, I don't think I even scratched the surface of it. Right. And we, we did a, a report, Kate's mentioned, called Cultural Club a couple of years ago, just looking at sort of diversity in, in London's arts. And I was genuinely shocked. I mean, I had sort of, I knew there were problems, but I sort of did rather naively think, you know, oh, it's a pretty sort of open liberal sector. You know, I mean, it, it was so dominated by, you know, well-off white men. 
Um, and it is so hard uh, for all sorts of reasons for people from you know, less advantaged backgrounds and diverse backgrounds to sort of get, a, get access to it. Um, yeah. Uh, Gus, I mean, first of all, just tell us a bit more about um, what you're planning uh, with VNA East. And then I suppose, what, you know, what, what is your sort of biggest worry about the impact of, of, of COVID on the arts in London? Um, well, VNA East, it, in a way, it is an answer to some of the questions that, that Ed asks. And Ed, Ed is actually being very modest because he, the way in which he poses it, that um, he, didn't, he didn't find solutions to many of the, these problems around diversity, but he, he and David Lammy were both there to ask the questions, questions which weren't even being asked um, a generation ago. And, you know, I'm grateful to them because um, in a way, VNA East is, is one of the legacies of, of people asking really hard questions about how we, how we reconfigure our cultural offer to better um, give some of the communities who, who are the most creative, but who also in their, um, in, in their tax pounds are paying for our culture, but not actually in getting any benefit from it. So on the Olympic Park, it is a new museum, four floors, um, which is um, being designed by um, um, a fantastic architecture um, um, set that will, that will tell the story of, not just of our collection, but of, 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 of new creative practice, um, that will hopefully engage new audiences beyond West and, and beyond East London. But also one of the critical things that we're really excited about is our collection of 250,000 objects of, of 360,000 books of 900 archives will actually be openly accessible in a new, in a new center which um, will be a different kind of collection center because we want it to, rather than just be full of researchers and academics, we want it to be full of creative people and young people um, engaging with the objects in the way that you might in a public art, um, library, that this is our collection and we want people to feel that they can, they can use and enjoy it. And we want to create the digital um, infrastructure so even if you can't visit that you will feel that it's a space that can be meaningful to you and that you can engage with because um, we'll be part of a campus which will include London College of Fashion, um, a new BBC, University College London, Sadler's Wells, um, new venues which will all be offering um, new opportunities for East Londoners. So it's an exciting moment and I'm really kind of hoping that this will galvanise a bit of London which hasn't had this kind of cultural investment before and yet has given us some of the great um, artists um, and I just feel it's a way of us recalibrating, rebalancing our city, city in a much more equitable way. Yeah, and it's, it seems to be a nice example of rebalancing or levelling up, as the government now calls it. And so far as Ed sold a bit of expensive property in West London and has redistributed it to, 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 to East London. So um, perhaps perhaps more of that. <laughs> um, Jessica, I mean, look, just looking at uh, you know, the world that, that, that you know and you're, you're moving in, I mean, how has the pandemic affected that, particularly sort of affected younger um, creatives? I think it's, I think for one thing, because before the, just before the pandemic started, the week before lockdown, I was on my young director's training programme, but also looking for work to go alongside it. And as soon as the pandemic hit, it cancelled everything I had planned. So I was, I think a lot of creators like me were thinking, okay, do I just change career now? What do I do? Because it was such a week of like anxiety that you were just thinking, okay, what's the best move I can make right now? But I think because what kept me going as well was the fact that a lot of um, theatres or um, the creative industries were offering sort of online programs to sort of develop your skills. And I thought, okay, if I can't work in my sector at the moment, I'm gonna just study and try to do the best I can since it was since there wasn't much at the moment. So that's how I was going about it. And I think it was also the support of Brent as well because they then had to think about, okay, how can they change their programs to sort of still engage their audiences and young people, but not lose them. So a lot of our activities then turned into like online sort of forms. So we had like the Brent Locked In interviews, which was young people interviewing um, brand icons from the borough and how the borough had shaped them 
but um in terms of the creative industries i think it was it's a tough one that a lot of us were sort of feeling okay where do we go we don't know where to turn but because there were opportunities where we could sort of develop our skills that sort of kept us going or I'd, i had to then reach out to theaters and be like okay um okay what's another skill i can develop okay i can script read so i thought is there any theaters that need scripts to be read can i be can i be paid to do that and so it was just finding different ways to still do what i love doing but finding another form to do it and to make money so that's how i had to approach it um and that's how i've survived during this time as well um yeah brilliant okay and ed, ed i mean i suppose just some reflections uh, from you on how well do you think the government has responded to um supporting uh, culture in, in, in the pandemic and also this particular issue uh, of sort of freelancers in the pop culture, culture sector where it, you know it, they've grown they're, 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 they're disproportionately sort of represented amongst the cultural workforce and and I think disproportionately represented amongst the freelance workforce which, is, which itself has grown and clearly they're sort of very, very vulnerable. Is there a new deal that we can be offering them? Well, look, I'm not uh, sitting behind Oliver Dowden's desk and I'm not privy to the kind of uh, negotiations they're having with the Treasury or indeed the kind of whys and wherefores of how to support freelancers. I know, based on my own ministerial experience, without wishing to sound ridiculously pompous, that sometimes the kind of headline figures that appear in, in the press don't reflect, again, the kind of complex debate one might have be having behind closed doors about how you actually make a programme work and how it's effective. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, again, without wishing to sound ridiculous, I wouldn't want at the moment Oliver Dowden's job for any, <laughs> anything in the world in some ways, because you know, you've just taken on what I regard as the best job in government. And it's um, uh, become this kind of terrible horror, horror show. So I feel for him. He's appointed Neil Mendoza as his cultural commissioner. And Neil is a fantastic, compassionate supporter of the arts and has been for many years. And don't forget as well that Minira Mirza, the Deputy Mayor of Culture is head of the Downing Street Policy Unit, and people may or may not have issues with Boris Johnson's achievements as mayor, but uh, most people would, if they were being fair, reflect on the fact that Manira was a very passionate uh, cultural mayor. So there's no lack of, of uh, goodwill, if you like, and I know goodwill doesn't help anyone pay their bills in, in government. Clearly, and this is again the benefit of hindsight, you know, the money, there's a lot of money, 1.6 1, 1. billion. Um, and once the money went out, people were very pleased to receive it. I, I, I would, you know, if I could have waved a magic wand, I would have just done a quick and dirty right at the beginning of um, lockdown and said, you know, what are people's, what's people's annual income? Let's match it for a year so that people just know they can pay the bills and be ready to turn the lights on. Uh, the freelancers debate has been very frustrating for a lot of people but as I say I'm reluctant to kind of get into uh, whether or not the government's been fair because I suspect there were all sorts of complicated uh, factors and there may also have been other issues like you know uh, we, we have a, a, a scheme to support the self-employed to which freelancers can uh, can access um, but I, I think you know I, I, I do think the government lost a bit of goodwill it, it took a long time it took a long time to secure the funding and it took a long time to get it out and that was i think a missed opportunity if they'd been earlier with as big a sum and got the sum out earlier i think they would have had a lot of goodwill and i also think obviously with lockdown two they can't just say this is the end of the conversation we've done our bit to support the arts they clearly there clearly needs to be another art bailout yeah. fund ready Great. And can I just ask all of, all three of you, um, in turn, maybe starting with 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 Gus, just sort of ref reflect on what, if any, might prove to be the sort of positives for the sector um, in uh, in the pandemic. I mean, what what might come out of it that you know, is positive? I, th I think we've certainly had to to think about what digital engagement might actually really mean because um, I, I think for us as a cultural institution, trying to draw people into museums um, post, post um, COVID is going to prove a challenge. Our model was based before that on large numbers of international visitors. We have to now reconsider how we actually balance our books. So that in part will force us to reinvest in 
building audiences domestically, thinking about how we engage digitally. And I think it will bring on about us actually facing into a set of challenges, which we probably thought might have been a generation away of how we bring a kind of greater equity to our delivery, how we actually really engage with, with, with a wider constituency of people, particularly Gen Z, for whom digital engagement is probably the, 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 the primary mechanism for them engaging with culture. So I think for us, it's offered a set of opportunities, um, um, a course huge challenge, but a set of opportunities in how we, 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 we might engage with, with, with the digital and also with a younger generation. And I think that is probably a good thing. Great. Jessica, do, do you see any, any positives coming out of this? Um, yeah, I think one thing, a bit similar to what Gus said, so I think the fact that we've got, we've got technology and that's allowed, I guess, myself and others to be able to showcase their work online or having to transform how they make work. And I think it's allowed people, a lot more people to sort of see the work you create, especially as a theatre person or a creative. So I think that's a positive. And I think just also the support that creatives have amongst each other already. So I think knowing that even though there is a pandemic, I mean, they could have just stopped making art, but instead people have still made art or found new ways of finding to make art and making sure that loads of people get to see it or try to sort of make sure that the world of the city sort of understands why it's important to have art and creativity and what it does for people in such a time like the pandemic, where it's like there is all these negative issues, but we've got all this artwork and creative artists who are trying to think about, okay, what can we do to make it better? So I think it is definitely the support and being able to use digital means to make it more accessible as well. I'm, I'm on the, uh, the board of the Yard Theatre um, in Hackney Wick, and I mean, luckily we have got Arts Council support, uh, and it's been tough, and we've had to furlough people. But I think I, I can say, I'm not going to get in trouble with the director, that um, it's also provided an opportunity for just us to, and for him and for the team to just to reflect a bit and think a bit more long term and put some to so the house in order on, on, on various things. So not, not, not all negative. Ed, Ed, any positives for you? Well, I saw um, Grace and Perry made quite a provocative uh, statement in the last few days saying that uh, a lot of dead wood had been cleared <laughs> out from the house. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd agree with him. I mean, one of my yeah. achievements, I think, was to get Darren Henley and Peter Basildjet into the Arts Council. And Darren, in particular, I think, has made the Arts Council a, a ruthlessly efficient but very supportive uh, organisation. So I'm not sure there is um, that much dead wood around. But having said that... Um, you know, even even during austerity, one of the things I kind of railed against was people saying, you know, hundreds of museums are closing. And I would say, well, well, they're not actually. Some are consolidating and some are some people are having to make decisions because money is tighter. That should have been made even in times of plenty. They're rational, sensible decisions. So some of that may happen. It kind of reflects what you said, Ben, about the yard thinking about uh, the future. You know, there may be rational and sensible decisions that you're going to take. Uh, that you could have made in a time of plenty, but the time of famine has forced you to make them. I think digital is obviously another opportunity where I think a kind of hybrid world, I think a lot of museums and indeed theatres are discovering that they have audiences all around the world that they can really quite meaningfully engage with in a way that again was kind of second fiddle to what they were doing before. Now I hope that people re regard digital as being absolutely integrated into everything they do and, and digital sits alongside or even comes first uh, when they're thinking about, you know, exhibitions or performances, because I think that they, they've discovered that there are lots of people they can reach out to who over time will become very engaged parts of their community, even if they can't physically be in their space. Yeah, and that obviously is a huge um, advantage for London, uh, yeah, because it is a sort of centre both of digital and of these sort of extraordinary cultural institutions. And if actually the sort of more and more of the world goes online, probably more and more of the world are going to find themselves going to London institutions. And actually one of the sort of you know, paradoxical effects of this, this, this pandemic, uh, where lots of people are worrying about whether it's the end of the city, is actually it might even further um, elevate world cities over and against other you know, more uh, sort of national or, or, or local cities, just because you know, if everybody can access uh, theatre or exhibitions online, you're pretty soon going to find your way to the National Theatre or the Royal Opera House or the British Museum um, or the v &A. Uh, So, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I, it's an advantage, uh, potentially an opportunity for London as, as, as well as a, 
a challenge. Just going back to this sort of issue of sort of diversity, and again, I know it's something we've been wrestling with it at, at the yard. What are the sort of what are the one or two really big changes, Jessica, that you'd like to see um, uh, from the cultural sector or perhaps your performing arts sector in particular when it comes to just sort of opening up um, our institutions and and the the, the cultural sector to people from you know black and ethnic minority backgrounds in particular. Um, I think what I'd like to see as well. I guess it's looking at two. One of the two big issues I'd say I've seen growing up is I think the question of representation. The people who are I guess in charge of those sectors. Who do you have on your boards? Who's making the decisions? And knowing that if you are thinking about making work for a specific community, do you have somebody there that is from that community can that can sort of advise you or support you in making those decisions? And I think just thinking a bit more about um, the financial aspects of it, because I guess I, I'm counted as somebody who's from a low economic social background. And I think, I guess, a big issue is, OK, you're scared to enter the arts because of money. Or if you're doing a placement, is it paid? And I think just knowing that because someone like me needs to have these opportunities and programs to build up my skills. But then I also need to be valued in the sense that the work I'm giving needs to be paid for. So making sure that there are much many more paid sort of placements or creative placements that allow somebody to progress through what they're doing and programs that sort of train you to Sort of go on your way as a as an artist or a creative. I think those are the two big things I'd like to see changed within the industry. And when, when for for our cultural club report, when we looked at looked at the the economy of the sector, you know what we found is actually there are lots of very very well paid jobs in the creative industries. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a myth that, that that it's badly paid. Uh, it's just that they're sort of hoarded by people from you know pri privileged backgrounds. Uh, yeah. Gus, what what you know what what are the one or two things that that you think would be really powerful that particularly the museum sector, perhaps the cultural sector more generally can do to promote diversity and just open up the opportunities and the, and the participation from people in different backgrounds? Um, I do think one of the things is for us to actually kind of face into our histories as well, because, um, you know, for many of our institutions that we are kind of built upon kind of quite complex and difficult and troubling um, uh, heritage, which we haven't actually faced into or dealt with. And for many of our visitors, I think that is a bit of a hurdle that we, you know, part of the Black Lives Matters uh, moment for the culture sector was also in us actually thinking about the relationships of our collections and our programs to issues like, like enslavement, um, uh, colonialism, um, uh, to uh, complex gender politics. And, and we, as a liberal sector, haven't dealt with these things, that we've tried to sort of paper over them, we've tried to sort of um, dodge them with, 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 with kind of short labels, but it's time for us to actually face into them. We didn't, this generation didn't create those issues. So I think we shouldn't feel scared about actually trying to deal with them because at the moment, the people who are carrying so much of this are the people who probably feel most frustrated and whose genealogy in some way links them to the parts of the world which were the greatest victims of this. So I think there's an opportunity for us in this time of, 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 of wider ambient kind of frustration to actually for the arts to become a kind of a crucible of catharsis. And um, I look at our collections and I can see all sorts of avenues and opportunities for doing that sort of work. Brilliant. And we had a discussion about this on, on Monday, um, you know, and it was a sort of contrast drawn between the sort of, you know, the very dead character of public statues um, and you know, on what you can do in a in a, in a museum in terms of just engaging people and telling stories, um, and and the rest of it that I thought was very powerful. Um, question here uh, in the in the Q and A, just about um, inner and outer London you know, uh, from Elizabeth uh, Wells. A lot of people are saying that London's economy is shifting from the centre to the suburbs post COVID. Do you see the same thing happening with the creative industries, and what might this mean for local? art scene. So I suppose, I mean, perhaps there's a question both for, you know, are the, are the arts and culture too concentrated in London versus the rest of the country? And are they too, have they been too concentrated in sort of central London? Um, you know, should we be re, re, uh, redirecting cultural funding to, um, well, let's, let's, let, let's stick with the London one for the moment to, 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 to outer London, or are we happy with this very sort of 
um, central model that we've developed. Ed? I mean, I think it's a, it's a complicated question, obviously. Uh, the, the, the statistics belie the, the truth in the sense that, you know, if you take the money that goes to our national museums, which are concentrated in central London, then it looks like London gets the lion's share of the funding, but it's not actually a, a fair comparison. The Arts Council has done a lot to correct the balance in, in any event to get more funding out of London. And indeed, a lot of our national museums have a strong presence in other cities, whether it's Tate uh, or v and uh, I once provocatively said to somebody at the Natural History Museum that I would sell the Natural History, I've obviously got a taste for it after selling Blythe House, I'd sell the Natural <laughs> History Museum uh, for luxury flats and I'd build a massive warehouse off, uh, you know, one of the motorways that people could go and visit, you know, perhaps one outside Birmingham, because uh, again, one of my sort of frustrations is, you know, I want to write a book, what have the Victorians ever done for us, that we're stuck with these kind of legacy buildings that were put up in the 19th century without anyone thinking again about how people move around the country and access points. And why couldn't you have a museum off a motorway? And indeed, the Science Museum has an airfield wrought and just outside Swindon that I'm really anxious that they develop. It's a treasure trove of artifacts that they keep there. It would be a wonderful visitor attraction. So you could actually do stuff. But at the end of the day, there is there is a kind of it's frustrating for people who live outside London, but there's an overwhelming case that London is the easiest place to get to wherever you live in the country. It is the easiest place to get to if you live outside of uh, the UK. And the visit the extraordinary visitor numbers that you see uh, for our national museums in London do, I think, show that they are probably in the right location. But I, it is incumbent on government to keep focusing on how to support the arts outside London, because na- London is is, a, as you said earlier, a world city. And, and the kind of resentment of London misses the point that London is probably the world's only truly global city in terms of the diaspora it has from other countries all over the world. And that is just, you know, it's just a fact of life it happens to be in the United Kingdom and we have to suck it up to a certain extent. Jessica, just thinking about sort of culture in, in outer London and your, your particular patch of the woods, Brent. I mean, it doesn't have, it's got one really one cultural institution, hasn't it? Which is um, the Kiln Theatre in the very east of the borough. And otherwise, there there isn't much. I mean, it, where would you like to see money going? Or if, if you could create sort of a new, would it be a new institution in, in Brent? Would it be something much more distributed, much more grassroots? I think I think both, especially with the London Borough of Culture. I think I'd like to see something more grassroots because I think one thing about Brent that I guess has really been shown to me is the amount of the amount of creativity it already has, but I think it's just given it that platform to shine. And I think, as you said, since we've only had we only had Kiln Theatre, it's like okay, unless you are in central London or live in South London where you can access these theatres, you wouldn't be able to go there because of several different issues. So I think it is just investing a bit more into like the people within the community and making sure you're going okay, what is it you want to make or what change you want to make in your local community, and making sure that everybody can celebrate that. Because I also think we've also got the stadium, but I guess nobody will, unless you only come, if you come to Wembley Stadium, then you know Brent. But apart from that, you don't know anything else about Brent. So I think initiatives like the London Borough of Culture has allowed it to invest money into its local communities. And some projects are what people have to go, okay, this is who I am. This is the work I want to see. So I think it is definitely investing a bit more into grassroots organisations and creating spaces where, um, creating a few more art organisations, I guess, like the Kiln Theatre, where you can have other pieces of work showing as well. Um, it's a question, Gus, which I now actually can't see, but I saw it before about, um, you know, a lot of museums are putting their collections online, particularly in response to the, to the pandemic. But are people actually, uh, are people, are people going online to, to, to enjoy them, to experience them? I mean, is this really a future, they, okay. you know, can you imagine a future where, where people choose to sort of spend an hour, um, you know, going around the v virtually, you know, rather than, um, you know, on their, on their Game Boy or, or whatever? whatever it's called now. But I, I think that possibly is a sort of a 20th century analogue of what a museum is sort of disposed, kind of in some way imposed within a digital framework. Maybe we can do something different that um, we could use social media as a mechanism for discussing some of the sorts of complex issues that, that our collections um, might provoke you know, that our collections, that they are kind of repositories of, 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 of colonialism, of, 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 of all kinds of kind of complex 
um, periods and passages of our history, we could use that as a kind of a, a, a forum for all kinds of debate and to do it in a, in a space which would be safe and engaging, but also driven by work which is which is simultaneously deeply inspiring. So I think there are opportunities for us not to just replicate a kind of university seminar, but to do something which speaks to a generation that through social media are experts in thinking about discourse. Let's use those tools and use some of the sorts of frustration that you see sort of, you know, Gen Z fermenting. Uh, 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 I think let's, bring those things together, but use museums, have museums as a forum for them. I think that is what possibly a 21st century version of the South Ken or the, you know, the, the, the original BN could actually be, is that they become sort of, you know, crucibles of, of really kind of um, interesting discussion about the contemporary, but through a lens of, of, of heritage. And, and you're nodding, and I also know yeah. that you are chair, you're chair of the advisory board of Digital Theatre. Um, I've got a question here about the sort of future of the West End and the future of, of theatre, I mean, partly because the West End, of course, depends so much on, on international visitors. I mean, just talk a bit about sort of the role of digital in the future of the theatre and perhaps the West End in particular. Well, I mean, I do, just to pick up on what sort of Gus said, and uh, <laughs> that I hope this isn't an unfair follow-on, as it were, uh, but you know, I do slightly want to smash it all up because I do think, as I say, that we've got <laughs> we've got these huge, vast Victorian buildings which are fortune to maintain, which were built by our great, 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 great grandparents to do, to do a certain job, and in a certain time, in a certain context. And the whole Black Lives Matter and colonial stuff has really highlighted all this. So I would love to see museums as living, breathing organisations that use the power of objects and the past, perhaps, to interpret the world we live in. Uh, today and to do it in different ways. You know, I did, I said to the Hartwig Fisher at the British Museum when we had lunch, and he's never ever spoken to me again. I said, you know, I think the British <laughs> Museum has too, too much stuff in it. You know, I come in and I'm kind of overwhelmed. I'd much rather just come in and see 20 objects that I knew were incredibly important and kind of be immersed in those objects and, and why they are iconic, as it were. So I think all of that has to be kind of broken up and rethought, but it'll never happen, but it would be lovely <laughs> if it did. And it's the same with the West End. I said to Andrew Lloyd Webber, oh, I did a podcast with him quite recently, and he sort of agreed with me, which is I'd knock down every single West End theatre, bar maybe three that I would keep as an example of what the Victorians were capable of building, because they're absolutely awful places to go and watch a play in. I mean, they're kind of rackety places that we're constantly having to maintain. I would smash them all up and have modern theatres like the Bridge Theatre that people could actually enjoy going to. You know. This is what cinema has the luxury of doing. You go to Westfield now to watch a film. It's like, you know, flying business class to New York. It's incredible. So, uh, and I think digital theatre is a very good case in point where we've struggled for years to get the theatre world to take us seriously. Suddenly, of course, uh, the relationship is, is going gangbusters. Uh, but why, were, you know, it, it's a myth to say that digital takes away from the live audience. It's a myth to say, uh, you know, that it somehow ruins the live performance. There are millions of people out there who would love to see some of our great actors uh, in iconic performances who will never, simply never get the chance to see them live. How are we catering for them? If you're worried about the audiences of the future, you can engage them with a company like Digital Theatre. I know this sounds like a shameless plug, but NT Live is a good example as well. You can really engage them early on in an informal way uh, on on this kind of stuff. With the National Youth Theatre, I engineered a deal with TikTok, which again caused some of the trustees of the National Youth Theatre to have an attack of uh, the vapours. But, you know, my view was, I look at my 12-year-old daughter, she is on TikTok, literally, permanently. If I'm going to reach her through the National Youth Theatre, I want her to audition, when the time is right, on, the, on TikTok or something like that. So all of these kind of tools... There's a constant uh, refrain of, you know, the museum will see you now. Uh, you know, it's not about the privilege of being able to visit a museum. It's about getting out there and uh, really engaging with audiences in the way that people live their lives today, which is a complete 
vision and dream for me. And I absolutely accept if I was sitting behind the desk of a museum trying to make this happen, it'd be an absolute nightmare or indeed a theatre. <laughs> but I just wanted to kind of vent and yeah. uh, get it out there. Yeah. I don't think we at Centre for London would approve of the idea of a museum on a motorway because we, we, we're not mad on motorways. And I, I actually think <laughs> museums are sort of urban institutions. But 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 I I, I understand where you're where you're coming from. Jessica, I mean, we are, what do you see as a relationship? I mean, people, Gus and, and I think Ed have both referred to sort of, you know, the, the very different relationship younger people have to uh, to, to, to digital. Um, and you are, here you are, you are young. What yeah. do you, um, what do you see as, uh, as, as I said, sort of the future of the relationship between the, the performing arts in particular and digital? Um, yeah, I think, I think it has, as we've talked about already, I think it has, we have seen the benefits of um, being able to program sort of theatre shows via digital or through NT Live. And I think those are great opportunities, but I think it also does, I don't know how, I don't know if the whole theatre world, I guess once after COVID would continue going down that way. I think it does allow for people to see performances or see see performances from places they usually wouldn't be able to go to. But I think the beauty of theatre, I guess, is that live performance and being in a room with people. So I think it is it is definitely a way to go. And I think a lot of young people, as, as you both have mentioned, Ed and Garth, do seem to spend a lot of times on technology or that they're on their phones. And that's the way people go like, you just need to put an Insta page up and create content and you've got an audience straight away. Um, and so I think, yes, it's beneficial, but also it's also not forgetting the beauty of um, what is it being able to go to theatre and why theatre is not a film or theatre is not like a live concert that you're streaming. It's sort of very different because that's the medium it is. So I see the positives of it, but also not forgetting like, OK, but theatre itself, being in, a, being in a room with an audience or teaching young people acting. Like I think now I'm having to learn the challenge of doing my acting classes online with a group of young people, which is a bit hard because I can't be like, OK, could you just jump up for me and I can see all of them or we'll do a monologue. And so I think it's just it just sort of limits the way we can sort of teach theatre in that way when it's online but I guess a lot of us are having to just sort of accommodate to that way so yeah I think it's like positives and a few sort of limitations when it comes to it as well is what I'd say on that. Brilliant. Yeah I totally I totally agree with you Jessica and those are wise words I mean I, I wouldn't you know I always have to have the caveat you know nothing will replace live theatre I just think again it sort of goes back to my earlier remarks that I think too too many people think of digital as an afterthought and it should be woven into the fabric. So if you're putting on a performance, of course you want a live audience, uh, but you do also have to think this is an opportunity to reach people who uh, won't come to theatre uh, or simply don't live near the theatre. Uh, and who knows, developing that relationship, who knows where it will end up. Yeah. And, and at the moment, too, too many people think, oh, can't be bothered. I, I think it should be moved right up to kind of centre stage, but without detracting from the live performance. Can I can I ask a bit about um, schools? I mean, you know, we, we had for a while in London, in particular, I think it was under creative partnerships. It's a sort of great partnership between London schools and its cultural organisations. Um, I mean, is that has that been lost? Is the more we is the more we can do? I mean, Gus, how in particular how, how will the VNA East work with school children, and will it just be London local school children, London school children nationally? Well, we will of course be working with the the four boroughs that surround the Olympic Park and the children that live within those boroughs very intensively. But we want to we are a national institution, and we want to create the digital tools that will mean that we can hopefully um, fulfill certain sorts of areas of the curriculum that, um, that people would want to support. And our, our collections speak really powerfully to, to areas of the collection, uh, areas of the curriculum that um, I think a lot of kids would really like to um, to explore. I think particularly around issues of, of of the colonial. So we're very very excited about offering a national offer, which is digital, but also in drawing in young people from across the four boroughs that surround the Olympic Park. Right. We 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 had David Olasogo at, at, at our discussion on Black Lives Matter and, and statues in the public realm on on Monday, and he made the point that you know what is the most sort of distinguishing feature of, of, of Britain, uh, it's its empire. And yet we don't have a museum to empire. We don't, unlike many countries, um, at least in, in, in the capital, have a museum of migration. I mean, would you be, and this is a question for all three of you, I think, would you be in favor of sort of new institutions that, that addressed migration and, and empire, or would you see this as something that could 
take place uh, in existing institutions or, yeah. Gus, let's, let's go with you first. Well, the British Museum, what, 1752, it's at the point in which it coincides with us actually as a, as a nation beginning to think about our place beyond our shores in a really kind of meaningful and, and aggressive way. And as an institution, you look at its collection and it tells the story of us in relation to, to empire and also and to, to, the, to the, the post-colonial moment and, and, and enslavement. You know, Han Sloan, its founder, he was a, um, a, a, a slave owner. You know, many of the very earliest bits of the collection are, 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 are there's a, an, a, an African drum which he actually collected from um, one of his plantations um, in the in the Carolinas, I think. So our our existing museums tell that story, but we need to find the ways of making sure that we are all much more comfortable at first so that we acclimatize the nation to this because it's a horrendous thing that we haven't dealt with and we need a kind of moment of truth and reconciliation in which we come to terms with with this history in a much more um in a much more healthy way and then for our museums alongside that to begin to tell these stories in ways that are much more open and 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 much more honest because i think for many of the curators they feel the same frustration that most people of color and most kind of um fair-minded people when they go around these spaces that we're not telling these stories in ways that make us feel proud and i think the time is now if ever there was a time in my life it is now for us to address this Je jessica and ed i mean but ed, ed are you would you see the case for some a new inst a new institution a new museum or do you support gus's idea of just telling the story differently in our existing ones well, I think you could do both. I mean, we've got the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, which was groundbreaking in uh, what it what it does now. And uh, I do agree with Gus that the time is now, both in terms of reinterpreting uh, collections to put them in context. You know, the right seems to be intent on some kind of weird faux culture war and perfectly um, normal, uh, routine, academic, uh, examinations become part of that culture war. So the National Trust recently published a very carefully researched year-long project on the links of its houses to slavery and empire, which should simply add to the sum of human knowledge and contextualize things, but it became this kind of inflammatory, you know, how dare the National Trust do this kind of work. So I would obviously support the reinterpretation of collections because people are much more conscious and aware of uh, the context and how these collections came to be acquired and uh, I would certainly want to see uh, just as they have in Washington you know a museum of migration and so on uh, but you have to I mean this sounds slightly defeatist but one always has to be careful that you don't disappear down a rabbit hole that people want to push you down of you know how dare these people denigrate our great British history and so on um, and you can end up in a sort of massive bun fight which detracts from actually uh, something very noble that you're trying to achieve. That was always my concern when I was pushing the diversity agenda in government. A lot of people said, you know, we would like to see quotas and targets. And I said, really be careful what you wish for, because the minute you start talking in that direction, the people who oppose you will be delighted to push you into that silo and simply talk about quotas for the next five years instead of actually doing something to make a difference. So I think you could certainly start with reinterpretation of collections. I think museum directors should have the courage to do so. And those of us who care passionately about their work should have the courage to support them in doing it. Good. Good. I, I, hear, hear. Jessica, both, um, I mean, any reflections on, on the way we sort of tell the story of Britain's you know, exploitative past, both with respect to slavery and empire? So that's one question. I suppose there's also a really good question here from um, my colleague, Deneen, about um, you know, the way in which when we did our culture club research, you know, we found that again and again, um, people who got into the creative industries uh, did so through 
the people they knew and and family networks and um if we can't even network now then what can be done to combat that and how, how, how do we how do we provide people who you know don't have the cultural capital or aren't from well-connected families um how, how do we provide them with the networks that they can use to get into this sector um, i think with that question because i guess i guess it is i guess through again with digital means i guess looking at so for instance, so for one, one thing I said to young people at a panel I talked about is, I think one thing they say about the industry is all about who you know. But I think one thing I'd rather say in terms of that is more about, okay, it's more about, it takes a community to get you to where you want to go. And so I looked at it as, okay, cool. The creative industries, the social inequality, there's all these issues. It's hard to network. I don't know this person, this person, but who do I know? Or what connections have I made from school or my placement year? And it's thinking, okay, if I can't, if there's an artistic director I want to reach, but it seems like everybody's trying to reach that person and I can't get through to them. Is there somebody that can support me in doing that or having mentors? And I think mentors and having that support network is what's gotten me to where I am now because I was like, okay, if I can't reach these people, who, who is in a position to help me get to that person? And so it's going, okay, now that we are in the pandemic, I felt like I've had to, I've searched up directors' names or people I want to network with on LinkedIn and it's going, hey, can I have a Zoom call with you for just a couple of minutes? Is that okay? And constantly sort of pestering them till they're able to do so. And so I think it is, it is just thinking about, okay, um, what, what can people who are, who are in top places sort of offer to young people or can I be that mentor for that person? Or is there somebody who, who I do look up to that I can ask to for advice? Because I think having mentors supporting young people to get them to where they are or in their journey is what's really important. Because as I don't know, who, I think you mentioned the person's name said, it is hard yeah. when you don't have, yeah, didn't you? It's hard when you don't have pockets of wealth and you can't reach those people. So it's going, okay, can we create initiatives where young people get to access people from these areas and sort of can have mentors that can guide them to where they want to go? Because that's how they're going to elevate. They can't do it on their own. So that's would be my answer to that. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, we were going to have a poll. Um, does somebody want to, and, and I think probably no doubt I was meant to sort of, um, bring this up halfway through the discussion. Uh, we're almost out of time, but should we just do, should we just do the poll? Right. Uh, so audience, if you just want to join in here. So what types of cultural events are you missing most? Theater, live music, a visit to an art gallery, live comedy, other show, others. Um, I'm not sure whether I can do this, but I better not if you want to see it. Um, and I, I suppose final, fi final reflections from each of you. Is there anything that we, 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 we haven't covered you, 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 you really want to say? And in, in, in the reason, I suppose it's just a question about Black Lives Matter and you know, a lot of organizations, including Center for London and, and, and The Yard and others I know have been really worrying away at how we um, bettering you know, engage, support, how, how we become sort of less racist organizations. And do you think this is going to leave a la lasting legacy? Are you, you know, are, are you seeing a real difference already in your organizations and organizations you work with in the way that they think and approach these things when it comes to racial justice, Gus? Um, yeah, and, and across the sector that there is a real palpable um, energy around this. I mean, I, I've worked in the sector for more than 25 years and um you know i spent my you know the vast majority of that on you know freelancing part-time jobs volunteering i could not get a really serious foothold and it took me what something like 20 years to get a full-time job and the first full-time job i got was as a director and um you know I, the frustration of so many people of my generation of not being given an opportunity is so great. It's not about us having transition, it's about the industry, the sector, just being open to engaging with recruitment in a fair and open way, because there is the talent out there. We just have to really look and to be open and to think about what is going to really benefit our institutions by engaging with the very best. Right. Uh, Ed, anything you want to add or, or this point about just the, you know, the, the racism in, in, this, in the sector, or if, if you're happy to call it that, or the, 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 the issues of racial justice? And, you know, are we at some sort of a turning point? I hope we are. It feels like it's become a no, at least a normal part of the conversation. I think the bit that, that, that is missing is, is, is the kind of nuts and bolts of making the effort to make change. And that can include little things like uh, giving uh, new recruits the money to get to work 
uh, you know, there's loads and loads of stuff that people, you know, and Jessica's absolutely right. You know, people like me, uh, we started life miles ahead. We had the contacts, we knew the people, we could, if we needed to afford to work for free. Uh, and when we reach a certain position where we're hiring, we forget that the people we're hiring may not have those opportunities. And I've talked to people like film producers and film directors who completely miss the point. They think they've sort of done the right thing by hiring the right people and they forget they haven't put in it in place any of the logistics to help them succeed once they've given them the job. So uh, you have to start at the bottom, but you also have to really change things at the top if you're going to change things. And uh, it has to be a continuous effort. So I think it is the, the big step change it's, it's become part of the mainstream conversation but the bit that is missing is putting in place the logistics to really make it happen right we're going to see, see the poll now um and we're running over time slightly but if you each wanted to recommend one thing that we can do uh in terms of culture um one thing we can consume or, or, or view or enjoy uh during lockdown uh, please feel free but um in the meantime the poll shows um uh live music, which we haven't really talked about at all. Um, that showing on my part. Uh, the theatre uh, is the second thing that's missed most. Uh, then a gallery, um, uh, live comedy coming last. Is there anything that you would like, the three of you, any, anything you'd really like to recommend uh, to our audience that they can in, that, that they can enjoy or participate in um, during lockdown? Je Jessica, are you doing anything? What should we look out for from, from, from you or from Brent Borough Culture? I think just look, what is Brent doing now? <laughs> Brent's doing later. Yeah. Oh, actually, we've got the Brent Biennial, which is sort of the visual artwork they've got around Brent. So I'd say look out for that and come to Brent and visit us. So that's what we've got going on at the moment. Gus, anything you want to encourage us to, 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 to engage with? I mean, do, do come in to the V&A. Even, even at the moment, you can get to see spaces with a degree of kind of freedom because there are few, so few people in our galleries it is glorious in that way but also the collections are just exquisite but also if you can't get in online we've done this amazing series pandemic objects in which people have reinterpreted objects from our collection through the the the, the frame of the pandemic and some of those pieces are so moving so lots of great things to engage with at the vnn ed anything you want to recommend you can take a, a subscription to Digital Theatre and you can listen to Ed Vase's brilliant podcast, <laughs> Breakout Culture, Breakout Culture, which comes out weekly where I discuss with Charlotte Metcalf what culture you can consume during a lockdown. Brilliant. Okay. Which will include what Gus, very convenient. Talked, Gus and uh, Jessica just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you so much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and chair this morning. I'm going to put my plug in. If anybody's listening, I want more uh, theater on YouTube, please. I, I love the National Theater Live. More theaters be doing this. I'm going to check out what your recommendations. Um, and uh, thank you so much today also to the sponsors of London Conference 2020, and those include major sponsors, the Corporation of the City of London, LNQ and Uber, supporting sponsors, London Councils, the London Legacy Development Corporation, London Property Alliance, the Greater London Authority, Primera and Trust for London, and exhibitors commonplace in the Port of London Authority. Uh, we're having at 12.30 today a special reflection on the Black experience in London this year. It'll look at policing, the impact of COVID-19 on Black communities in London, and especially on London's young people, uh, because we want this final day today to really be looking towards the future, and young Londoners are such an important part of that. Uh, and that's why the final quick fire session we're having today, which is one of the best parts of London Conference where we show new initiatives for London and Londoners is going to only be focusing on things that have been put forward by young Londoners this year. So that should be great. And that's at 3 p.m. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. We will see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.